All right, we will get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's panel. My name is Rachel Lushinsky, and I work in the Office of Undergraduate Research and Fellowships. I will be moderating this panel. We will be exploring a variety of topics at this session, and there is, of course, thematic overlap. But the reason all of these diverse presentations are together on this panel is that all of these projects were developed as a part of the Passionate Leaders Project, or the PLP. The PLP is a grant program where students are awarded up to $4,000 for experiential learning projects that enhance their academic, professional, and personal journey here at Simmons. We will be hearing from students who participated in research, internships, and creative projects that have led them to their findings that you will hear about today. Covering a wide range of topics, including public health, cultural preservation, and environmental conservation, today's presenters, all class of 2022, are Shania Ambrose, Emma Keeling, Beza Erdem, Maggie Clancy, Hannah Hawk, and Lauren Howard. The speakers will each give their presentations. Afterwards, there will be time for an audience Q&A. Please submit your questions for the presenters in the chat box. In addition, you will notice that the live transcript feature has been activated. To turn off the captions, click on the live transcript icon on your Zoom toolbar and select hide live transcript. And now we will begin the presentations. And Shania, you are up first. All right, does everyone see the presentation well or do they see my full screen? So thank you, Rachel, for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Shania, also known as Naya. Um, today, I will be talking about the progress of my creative project, Cordigo Art Space, sharing Cordillera and cultural knowledge through art. And so Cordigo is actually a combination of Cordilleran and Igorot. Igorot is a term to describe the collective group of indigenous ethnic groups in the Cordillera administrative region in northern Luzon, Philippines. I'm from Benguet, which is the region at the very bottom of the graphic, and I'm from the Ibaloy tribe. I'm a senior web design and development major with a minor in cinema and media studies. My project advisor for uh, this PLP project is Professor Hole, who is the associate professor of art history and the director of the arts administration program. And as an interdisciplinary student in the COM and CS department, I developed processes and skills over time where I could think about how technology or media influences our identity and how we navigate our environment. And due to our lives mostly shifting to the digital world in the last two years, many people lost their opportunity to connect with their communities, whether that's through festivals or the people who had the ability to tell the stories of our traditions. And if it wasn't for my parents or Facebook, I would only be able to see glimpses of how Igorots like myself or Igorots of the past in the States were once in the human zoos in the 1900s. And so I created this project to examine how human computer interactions can engage digital citizens in intercultural storytelling, community building, and ethically sourced cultural heritage learning. And because I was inspired by low Southeast Asian creative circles, various online communities, and AAPI activism during the pandemic, I was motivated to use my creative skills to uplift diasporic, igrot, and dynamic Cordillera narratives. Because throughout my project, I realized it's not just indigenous folks living in this area anymore, especially the dense population of Baguio City. Uh, I also wanted to convey how indigenous practices, traditions, and materialized culture influences our identity in changing environments, defy indigenous cultural and social stereotypes in safe online environments, and also make space for authentic learning of Igorot cultural heritage told by us and not just for Western scholars. And so to kickstart my project, I collaborated with Tam Awan Village, which is this art institution in Baguio City, Benguet, also where I'm from. I've only been to their museum once back in 2017, but thankfully they allowed this project to happen, which I'm very grateful for. And really quickly, I would want to like take you into the space. Let me see if I can step into this. Okay. Hopefully the, the gallery isn't too skewed. 
can everyone see like the can everyone see my screen switch over yeah okay nice 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 so something i realized through this experience as well is that it takes a long time to load especially in the philippines there were some typhoons in the area um, in my area specifically there was a lot of heavy rainfall so that affected connectivity and so because my uh, screen is kind of skewed what you can do is in this bottom left you can walk through this space here there are galleries you can use your arrow keys to uh, rotate you can even click on pieces on the wall and then it'll take you to like the information and you get closer to the artwork and then I also develop like hallways where you get to learn more about the artists themselves. Since the website itself or the platform is a work in progress, it will be available in May. I was able to use the graphics from the Moan Village to have like the artist bios on the wall. So anyone can learn more about like the people, the creators and that sort of uh, information. I gotta make... And so back to my presentation. Oh, I clicked there again. Okay. And so some things I've had to reflect upon when creating this project is exactly who is the audience and edge cases or potential users. Um, I created this previous project or this podcast. Um, I was wondering how this would differ from past media experiments because there are different there were a lot of different audiences I was not expecting the last time I created a project like this, which really impacted like the purpose and the intentions or like how this information I'm creating is being used by others, which is why that was something I had to consider. And then I also had to consider how will this scale or change over time, especially since I'm dealing with uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds or just uh, beliefs and ideologies. And so I know that was a little fast, but thank you for your time. You can find the website at cortigo.webflow.io. And then the perfectly flawed gallery is also on the link below. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Just give me a minute while I pull up my presentation. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Okay, um, so my name is Emma and I'm a senior here at Simmons and I'm majoring in public health with minors in biology and biostatistics and I'm in the accelerated uh, master's in public health program. And for my passion leaders project, I did an internship at Reach Beyond Domestic Violence. And my project was exploring the intersection between upstream and downstream approaches to domestic violence work. So to give a little bit of context about my internship, the location was Reaching Out Domestic Violence, which is in Waltham, Massachusetts, um, which was founded in 1981. And it serves over 7,000 people annually. And that serves 26 towns and cities um, in Eastern Massachusetts. And the mission at REACH is to empower individuals, families, and communities um, to overcome domestic violence because we all deserve safe, healthy relationships. And so you might be wondering, you know, kind of how does my internship um, kind of help along that mission? And so my role was an online chat and legislative advocacy intern. So the downstream side of that was the online chat where I was supporting survivors and community members on our online chat platform with a variety of different um, questions or resources, or if they just want someone um, to listen. And then the upstream part was working closely with my supervisor on promoting legislative advocacy. And so I worked with a bill called the Healthy Youth Act, which I'll explain a little bit just so the rest of my presentation makes sense. Um, and so this is a bill that requires school districts to offer safe sex education um, in schools that's medically accurate, um, age appropriate, and comprehensive. Um, in most states right now, uh, sexual health education doesn't actually have to be medically accurate. So that's something that I really didn't know going into this and kind of honestly surprised me. Um, but comprehensive sex ed really teaches about healthy relationships and boundaries and communication. And this is key in helping prevent um, sexual assault and sexual harassment and just fostering healthy or positive health outcomes. 
It's also really important because it's comprehensive of LGBTQ plus um, sexual health education. Um, and so this is really important to reduce isolation um, and barriers that contribute to LGBTQ plus youth um, facing a higher risk for sexual violence. And then lastly, just um, cultivating these open conversations about sexual health and consent can really increase the likelihood that youth survivors will be able to reach out for support, as well as just youth in general being able to pinpoint when, you know, something might be unhealthy or going wrong. Um, and then in terms of goals I had for this internship, I had a lot of goals, but a few of them about learn um, different social media strategies for promoting legislation as well as really increasing my knowledge on the online chat platform. So I've been a peer supporter in Simmons's um, Violence Prevention and Education Outreach Office for a few years, as well as a resident advisor. So I, pretty, I felt pretty comfortable in terms of like supporting someone within the college context, but I really wanted this opportunity to help me um, really understand different resources and, way, and things to give people that weren't within a college context. So things I don't come across in my you know, day-to-day -day work at college. So that could be things like um, people who have kids or working more closely with the legal system are things that I wasn't super familiar with yet. So in terms of the online chat, I think I definitely you know, made that goal of really understanding more outside of college context. And although I can't, you know, say any of the chats that I got um, specifically, I definitely learned a lot about, you know, when someone has kids or interacts with the legal system or things that, again, I just don't really see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then in addition, I wrote this blog post called um, Why Comprehensive, Medically Accurate and LGBTQ Inclusive Sex Ed Matters to Me. Um, so that's on the Reach Beyond Domestic Violence website, if you ever want to read it. And then I'm just going to go through some of the social media posts that I made. So you don't have to read these all um, and I won't read them out to you, but these are just some general ones that were promoting the Healthy Youth Act. And then these ones were for, based on LGBTQ plus um, things and like why um, the Healthy Youth Act is positive for the LGBTQ plus community, as well as some action steps. And then this one was for February for Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. So again, I included some statistics and then some teen dating violence prevention strategies. Um, one, you know, one that's included is just how having those really open conversations can help prevent teen dating violence. And then again, action steps. And then the last one that I'll share is kind of a letter to the editor style, but like in social media post form. Um, so three reasons why the Healthy Youth Act mattered to me, um, and then a call to action. And then I also made a blank template. So if anyone else wanted to you know, fill in their own reasons why they were passionate about this, um, they would be able to do that. And then these social media posts were shared with the Healthy Youth Act Coalition, which is about 20 different organizations across Massachusetts that are also promoting the Healthy Youth Act. So they would be able to put these on their social media um, sites. So in conclusion, I had a great time at my internship. Um, I definitely learned a lot, both on the online chat and um, working with the legislative advocacy. And I think that doing the downstream work of working on the online chat really helped inform my legislative advocacy work. So I was really glad that I was able to pair those two. Um, and then I just wanted to thank my two internship supervisors, um, Christian and Lauren, and then my Passionate Leaders Project um, faculty supervisor, Valerie Leiter. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Beza and I'm a biochem major. So for my thesis project, my project was called Focus Ultrasound Surgery Mediated Drug Delivery of an AAV9 Package Gene Therapy for Huntington Disease. And my advisors were Dr. Nick Todd and Dr. White. So to start off with a background, Huntington disease is a neurodegenerative genetic disorder that affects the basal ganglia area of the brain, so this portion, and um, this includes the striatum of the brain as well, and it is caused by a mutation in the HTT gene, and this occurs because of a greater than 36 CAG codon repeat of the glutamine residue, and currently there is no cure for Huntington disease, and this stems off of the reason because the blood-brain barrier does not allow us to send in many drugs for treatment. 
So the gene therapy that we use in our project is an miRNA, which are non-coding RNAs, and they can be used to suppress the mutated HTT gene. And basically it prevents the mRNA, so the messenger RNA, from translating the mutated gene into a mutated protein. So in order to deliver this miRNA, we use an AAV, adeno-associated virus, which can infect our cells without replicating. So in order to deliver this gene therapy, we use focus ultrasound. So focus ultrasound is a way to non-invasively target a specific region of the brain. So we had a mouse brain, and so the curved shape of the transducer allowed us to focus our sound waves into a single volume. So it was able to target a specific region. So in our case, that was the right hemisphere. And this was the diagram of what we actually use as our focus ultrasound in our project. So in order to deliver this, we need to disrupt the blood brain barrier that protects our brain. So we first injected micro bubbles into the bloodstream of the mice. So this was able to once come into contact with the focus ultrasound sound waves, they um, oscillated. So they um, got larger and smaller and this created forces enough to disrupt the blood brain barrier. And when we had those tight junctions opened up, we were able to deliver our gene therapy and that was able to go through those tight junctions. So we had two goals of our project. So first was the efficacy. So how well our gene therapy was able to go through our brain um, through the, um, the tight junctions of the mice blood brain barrier and which cells did we target? So we were targeting neuronal cells. So we looked at co-localization and in order to view that we used green fluorescent protein to look at expression. And then the other part of our project was looking at activation. So if our cells in our brain, such as astrocytes and microglia cells, were activated due to this disruption using focus ultrasound. And so GFAP was a marker for astrocytes and IBA1 for microglia. And so to analyze our data, we performed immunohistochemistry. And so this is an example of a brain mice tissue. So we used a VS120 microscope to image them. And then we used image day for our analysis. So this is um, a bigger image of a brain tissue for mice. And so with image J, we were able to outline regions of interest. So this is the striatum of the brain, and this is the cortex. So we, so our focus ultrasound disrupted the right hemisphere. So this was used as a control, the left side. And so we were able to calculate the mean intensity of our gene expression. So the second part of the efficacy portion was co-localization. So we did immunofluorescence. So first we used um, a vibratome and we cut our brain 30 micron sections. So this is an example of the mice brain in the vibratome instrument. So this blade went back and forth and cut the brain into thin slices. And so this is a 24 well plate with the brain slices inside of them. And so for immunofluorescence, um, this is what we did for um, co-localization. So we have our GFP staining. So this, wherever the green fluorescent protein is, that's where our um, gene therapy went into. So new nuan staining for our neuronal cells, which was our target. And then DAPI was a stain for just cell nuclei in general. And this is a merged image of a GFP stain and a new N stain. So anywhere that lights up a yellow color is kind of where GFP was transfected. So it was inside of our neuronal cells. And this was our targeted hemisphere. So the top um, row was our targeted hemisphere, and then the bottom row was our control. So as you can see, there was only one um, GFP cell for our non-targeted hemisphere, and a new one kind of went around it, so it wasn't really transfected with the GFP. So for activation, we looked at to see if our cells were activated in our brain. So we, um, for microglia cells, things we looked at to see if cells were activated were long, um, that were not activated were long process length, short cell bodies and non-regular shapes kind of told us that that microglia cell was resting and it wasn't activated because of our disruption of the blood brain barrier. And most of our cells were um, resting. So for our results, um, first we had looked at GFP expression. So how much of our gene therapy actually went into the brain? So there was a significant difference in the GFP expression in the cortex of the right hemisphere but there wasn't a significant difference for the striatum, but there was still more expression in the right hemisphere, which was a good sign because that was our targeted region. So for co-localization, which we looked at the overlap of our neuronal cells transfected with GFP, 24 to 28% were transfected in our targeted region, but only 5% were overlapped in our left hemisphere. 
So overall, it was very spatially heterogeneous and um, our project didn't look to see how what percentage would be able to lower the mutated protein, but we looked at efficacy and it was effective because we did see cells overlapped with our gene therapy. And when we looked at activation, we did see activation of astrocytes in the striatum and cortex for the right hemisphere, but we did not see any significant difference in our microglia activation in the striatum and cortex. Um, and these are my acknowledgments. Thank you to my thesis advisors, the Focus Ultrasound Lab at Brigham, um, the Simmons Chemistry and Physics Department, and the PLP grant. Thank you. Maggie, you're next. Sorry, apologies. Okay. So today I'm gonna to be talking about my research that I do within the Young Lab. And I am looking at methods to mitigate plastic waste in research laboratories. So the plastics problem can be defined as um, the rise in consumption and waste of single use plastics. So plastic consumption increases by 5% annually when the, within the United States, which is especially concerning considering that um, we're already one of the top producers of plastic in the world. So, um, or I'm sorry, of plastic waste in the world. So the majority of plastic waste ends up being shipped overseas for recycling or disposal, but this creates another issue of uh, displacement of responsibility waste and it also worsens plastic pollution in the oceans. So one community that is understudied in the evaluation of plastic waste is researchers and associated laboratories. So laboratories, they rely on single use plastic ware for sterility to uphold the integrity of experiments um, like being performed at the time. However, the plastics problem is worsening with time and the scientific community has the opportunity to make sustainable changes in the way that they practice their science to aid in the health of the earth. So, um, biological laboratories around the world contribute an estimated 5.5 tons of plastic waste annually. So this is a picture of how much um, plastic culture dishes that we accumulate in just a five person lab in one week. And this is without mention of the pipette tips, the tip boxes, gloves, and other plastic wear. So we estimated that we use over 4,000 plastic culture dishes annually in just our five person lab. So the plastics problem, it sometimes feels too big to comprehend, let alone address. However, when seeing firsthand how much plastic waste accumulates in the small lab that I worked in personally, um, I realized that um, to answer, like the answer to this question might not be so big. So first, um, I wanted to perform an evaluation of plastic waste in laboratories. So I surveyed um, biological laboratories across the country um, to estimate their contribution to plastic waste um, produced by labs overall. So while I don't have time to show you all of these results, what I ended up concluding is that there was a massive need to um, attempt to mitigate plastic waste in research labs. So based on this information, the aims of my research um, was to develop ways to mitigate plastic waste um, in labs. And so that led me to my second question, which is, is it possible to wash and reuse dishes um, being used to culture organisms without affecting the integrity of the experiment? So to answer this question, I ended up developing um, pretty cheap and simple methods to wash and reuse plastic culture dishes within labs. Okay, so in the Young Laboratory, we use the frog Xenophis labus as a model organism um, to study their development from embryo to tadpole to frog. So we obtain hundreds of embryos weekly. And as I previously stated, um, this creates a serious plastics problem. So frogs and amphibians um, are amphibians and they live in aquatic environments. So they are very sensitive to their external environment. So this makes them the perfect model organism to understand whether um, what I'm trying to do is actually working. So their sensitivity to um, external toxins in the environment environment increases when manipulations are performed, like transplants or injections. So the goal of my experiments was to clean dirty dishes, culture embryos, let them develop to tadpoles, and then measure their survival rates um, 
and the uh, like um, their ability to develop successfully to determine whether or not the cleaning methods I designed um, were harmful to the organism or the experiments being performed. And so if the cleaning methods I um, designed were harmful, then it would be recognizable in their development and survival. So these are the cleaning methods. Um, you simply take a dirty dish and you use either one of the treatments, you rinse them, and then it's a very simple process. So the thing about implementing a sustainable initiative is that it needs to be very, very simple simple um, and accessible for it to be implemented anywhere, especially in um, just very widespread. So the cleaning methods are cheap and simple for that exact same reason. So going into the results, um, first I cultured unmanipulated embryos and dishes that had been cleaned. So there was a high survival rate in the new unused dish, and then we si see higher lethality in the dirty dishes. However, we were able to restore the survival rates um, upon implementing the cleaning methods. So we were able to ultimately conclude that the cleaning methods restored the embryo survival rates as compared to that of a new dish. And um, this was very exciting because it answered our baseline question of yes, organisms can be cultured in the clean dishes without affecting their survival or development. And then taking this a step further, I completed transplants, um, which is the data depicted on the left of the screen and injections depicted on the right um, on different embryos. So this involves um, the experiments on the left, uh, are examples of microsurgeries. And so what happens is you cut the embryo in half and then you place two parts of different embryos together. So it's putting a lot of stress on the embryos. And that was the point. So with these experiments, I was able to do some really classic uh, developmental biology and embryology. And since the experiments, we know what the results are gonna be based on the science out there. We were able to determine like um, whether their um, survival and development was ultimately affected. So, um, and we were able to again conclude that their survival and development was not negatively affected by the cleaning, by like being placed in the clean dishes. So conclusions can be made. Um, the experiments performed provides data on the feasibility of washing and reusing plasticware in research labs that utilize living organisms. So there is a need for mitigation of plasticware use in research laboratories. We always we already know that, but we were able to um, like contribute data to the field to understand that it is feasible to wash and reuse plastic culture dishes without um, affecting the survival and development of Xenophis labus or affecting the efficacy of the experiments. So just to get like a larger view of the impact. Um, so one box of 250 culture dishes costs over $400 if you're buying from Thermo Fisher. And so um, if you're going through a large handful of those a year, there's obviously going to be a large financial strain. So if you're able to implement this like within labs, then you're not only saving a lot of um, like you're not only helping the environment by lessening your plastic consumption and disposal, but you're also able to allocate um, different grant funds to further your own research. Okay, so further conclusions, we're all familiar with the popular phrase of reduce, reuse, recycle, but reuse is the most effective method to reduce overall waste. So the intensity of the plastic problem stems from the consumption and the reuse addresses the rate of consumption most directly. So we mentioned that previously, if you're targeting consumption, then that's gonna be the most reliable way to actually not only affect like the chain of supply, but also um, just the future impacts of plastic waste. So still, if reuse is not acceptable in the laboratory setting or if living organisms can not be used or are not being used within these labs, these cleaning methods can be used to wash um, plasticware before recycling as that is required for um, a lot of recycling programs in um, like scientific manufacturers regardless. So the prevalent cost associated with cleaning um, and reusing lab plasticware is the time that it would take to clean the dishes. However, as previously mentioned, the reuse has the potential to save laboratories a significant amount of money. So while it is a personal um, choice within labs, there is, um, in my paper, I was able to perform a cost benefit analysis to understand whether the costs um, outweigh the or yeah, whether the benefits outweigh the costs or vice versa. And I was able to conclude that the benefits outweigh the cost, but of course time is a huge um, component within any laboratory, but um, the financial, I mean, you can save just so much money too, so. So when considering the extents of the plastic problem and research laboratories contribution, um, it becomes clear that there's significant space in the ways that science is conducted for a sustainable intervention. So researchers have a responsibility to be aware of how they conduct research and how that affects the environment, especially considering that the global effects of the plastic problem. 
I just want to say thank you to the Young Laboratory for um, being able to support this research and also the PLP, of course. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, hi everyone, my name is Hina. Um, I'm gonna be presenting on my thesis project about the characterization of food preservation coatings using scanning electron microscopy, also known as the SCM. So a little bit of background about food preservation. Um, about 30 to 40% of the US's total food supply ends up as food loss or food waste. Um, and about 110 billion pounds of that food ends up in landfills waiting to be incinerated. And upon incineration, the food releases methane gas into the environment, which is a very um, dangerous greenhouse gas. It's 18 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide. And the majority of food waste is found at the household level. Um, and the biggest contributor to this waste is fruits and vegetables. So one way that we are proposing that can elongate the shelf life of produce and preserve our foods is through the use of biomolecular coatings. Um, so these edible coatings work to kill and inhibit the growth of bacteria, elongate shelf life of produce, um, and they can also be sprayed or dipped. There's multiple ways of synthesizing these coatings, um, and the best part about them is that they're usually made up of organic ingredients, and they're all natural, so we can eat them, and they're also good for the environment. So as I said earlier, there's multiple ways that you can synthesize the coatings, but the proposed mechanism for my project is nanoemulsion. So nanoemulsion uses a bioactive ingredient that's encapsulated by a biopolymer matrix. Um, and in my project, the bioactive ingredient is neem oil and the biopolymer matrix is alginate. So apart from these ingredients, you can also add a texture modifier that adjusts the properties of the gel, such as how thick it is or how viscous it is. And after the coating dries, um, you're left with a clear, tasteless film that you can characterize. So one method of characterization is scanning electron microscopy, or the SEM. Um, the SEM is a really powerful tool that, tool that can be used to visualize the surface of materials at the nanometer level. Um, and you can determine surface properties such as the roughness, the thickness, homogeneity, um, the continuity, and also the adherence of the film to the surface. So this brings me to my project goals. So I'm going to be synthesizing the coatings following procedures that have been developed from past theses. Um, and then I'm going to be preparing different surfaces to coat the samples with, and then using the SEM to image those surfaces and determine the physical properties. So for my materials, I'm gonna be comparing two different types of coatings. There's gonna be pure alginate and then 0.2% volume to volume neem oil alginate coating. Um, and in the figure on the left, you can see on top, that is the neem oil that is being encapsulated by the alginate. Um, and then on the bottom, it's just the pure alginate um, empty capsule. So the surfaces that I'm going to be coating include metal, carbon tape, and a glass slide. And then I'm going to be using two different models of SEM. The first one is going to be the Hitachi SEM at Northeastern University's Imaging Lab. And the second one is going to be the Jewel SEM at the Simmons University Chemphys Department. So these are the results of the alginate cross-sectional images. So a cross-sectional image allows us to see the thickness of the film. So um, we randomly chose three regions along the edge of a glass slide coated with the alginate coating. Um, and we took images at 10, at 10K magnification and then again at 25K magnification. So what we can tell from these images is that there is variability about the thickness of the film. So like. Um, in region one, it's thinner, and in region three, it's thicker. So this kind of shows that there's, it's not really consistent, and it's also not homogeneous along the surface of this slide. And then we also took a look at the surface of the alginate neem oil coating. And on the left, we took a look at the whole surface at 35 magnification. And the darker regions represent the neem oil. And this tells us that it's being, um, pretty well incorporated into the coating and also dispersed throughout the entire surface. Um, and then we looked at it again at 700 magnification and this is kind of supporting our proposed mechanism of how the neem oil is being encapsulated by the alginate. 
Um, and I'm still taking results, so there's going to be more that's going to be developed for this project. But for the conclusions that we have so far, um, the pure alginate film is not homogeneously covering the surface. The um, thickness of the film, it varies along the edge. The alginate and neem oil film shows that it's well dispersed um, and encapsulation may be present, but further testing is required to determine that. And then finally, I would just like to acknowledge my two co-advisors and my lab collaborator, Alexa, and also Alice, who is the Northeastern Imaging Manager, and also the PLP for allowing me to conduct this project and supporting me throughout the year. Thank you. All right, can everybody see my screen? Good, okay, fantastic. Hello, my name is Lauren Howard. I am a history and poli sci double major. And as a little change of pace, we're actually gonna hop in a time machine and go back to the 1790s to talk about my project, Prior Will Not Be a Party Man, Partisanship and Party, Party Conflict in the Adams Administration. So I know I only have a few minutes with you, but we're gonna quickly run through my project background, preliminary questions, findings, and then my thesis and deliverables. And this project is the culmination of my work at the Massachusetts Historical Society in the spring of 2021. The MHS is the oldest historical society in the country. It was established in 1791, and it's home to one of the largest repositories of presidential papers in the country, the Adams Papers. And so the MHS houses all of the personal writings um, and correspondence of John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and Charles Francis Adams, as well as many other members of the Adams family, their family friends, and some of their closest associates. In coming into this project, I had a few questions and musings. I was really drawn to the study of partisanship, especially considering I was researching right after the election of 2020. And I was really interested in tracing the lineage, evolution, and pervasiveness of partisanship in American politics. And so my findings come from an in-depth analysis of the personal writings of John Adams, as well as others, that have been cross-referenced with the Annals of Congress and the House and Senate journals that record all of the happenings and debates that took place in Congress on any given day. And so the first thing I found was that John Adams loudly asserted that he was not a party man both before and during his presidency, excuse me, and more importantly, that he condemned party politics loudly and publicly. As president, he thought that it was his duty to steer impartially between the parties. And right before taking office, he was optimistic that he would remain neutral and that he would be able to remain aloof and far above party politics and party conflicts. That meant that the people around him knew that he was a self-professed, not a party man. And later, his refusal to play by the rules of party politics cost him dearly as it made him a man apart. And so as a result for his disavowal of party politics, Adams was completely alone and unsupported in his own party. Throughout his presidency, the Federalists, which Adams technically was a Federalist, um, they had a mighty majority in both the House and the Senate, and this would have been any other president's dream. But for Adams, it was his worst nightmare. That's because the Federalists in Congress didn't particularly like him, and they didn't feel any sort of allegiance to him, especially considering he went around condemning party politics, and he even refused to call himself a Federalist. And some congressmen disliked him on a deeply, deeply personal level, with one representative writing that he hoped that Adams's horse and carriage would run him over on his way back to Quincy. Instead, most Federalists in Congress and his own cabinet members were high Federalists, which meant that they were loyal to Alexander Hamilton. His cabinet members in particular would try to sabotage him. They would send classified documents and classified information back to Hamilton, who lived in New York at the time, and they would seek Hamilton out for advice and they would act on that advice. And this of course became disastrous for Adams when he and the rest of his party diverged on the all important issue of what to do with the French. So in July, 1797, three envoys who were sent to France to negotiate a solution to the continued harassment of American vessels by the French were approached by three men, let's call them X, Y, and Z, acting as intermediaries for the foreign minister. And as was customary in European politics at the time, they demanded a bribe to open negotiations. And of course the Americans refused to pay and they considered it a great insult and they sent word back to Adams immediately, 
And several months later in March, the news finally arrives in the Americas. And as a result of what was later called the XYZ affair, the quasi war between America and French kicks off in earnest. And Adams delivers an address to Congress asking them to provide provisions for the arming of merchant vessels and the fortification of the coastline. However, after he cools off a little bit and receives additional updates from the envoy still in France, he backpedals kind of furiously. And he urges Congress to let diplomacy run its course. In between April 30th and July 16th, more than 30 bills are passed as part of the high federalist pro-war agenda, including, of course, the Alien Sedition Acts. However, more than half of these bills were passed after Adams urged Congress to hold off. So that means the Federalists just kind of brushed off Adams's pleas and instead followed Hamilton, who was loudly calling for war with France. And this is important to note that obviously the president does have veto power, but at this point in our history, that president or precedent of the president using veto power wasn't established. The country is still traumatized from the American Revolution and Crown rule. And so the president's job at this time really was to just execute um, and enforce the will of the people. But as a result of this legislative landslide, partisan tensions increased tenfold between the high Federalists and the Democratic Republicans who were against war with France. And of course, tensions were already pretty high um, in the Adams administration with the lyons Griswold affair occurring in February 1798, the first instance of legislative violence in our country's history. But after the spring and summer of 1798, with this plethora of bills that were passed through, it becomes so much worse. Fights break out in the street between groups of men wearing black cockades and tricolor cockades, the symbols of the different parties. The Kentucky and Virginia resolutions are published later that year. And then in March 1799, Fry's Rebellion breaks out in Pennsylvania. And all of these conflicts are directly related to the high Federalist pro-war legislative agenda and the legislation that was passed despite Adams' request to wait for diplomacy to run its course, really in an act of disobedience against a president many of the high Federalists thought was a coward. And so the next election that we have is actually called the Revolution of 1800. And the Revolution of 1800 is a major turning point in US history as it reversed the balance of power. Federalists would never be able to recover and would never hold any branch of any signet or any office in any branch of significance ever again. They're pretty much purely delegated to a regional party based in New England from this point forward. But the next several presidents would be Democratic Republicans and then Jacksonians and eventually the party would turn into the Democratic Party. And the revolution of 1800 is often remembered as one of the most bitter and personal elections in US history. Yes, even, even rivaling the election of 2016 and the election of 2020. And so my main argument was that Adams's anti-party sentiment distanced him from the high Federalists, leaving him without their support in Congress. The high Federalists were then able to pass numerous pieces of legislation that both further, further aggravated tensions and mobilized support for the Democratic Republicans, thus increasing party conflict and eventually culminating in the revolution of 1800. And if you'd like to learn more about any of these things, you can listen to my podcast. It's on Spotify um, by the same name, of course, for I will not be a party man. If you Google it on Spotify, it will come right up. Or if you don't want to sit and listen to me talk for 45 minutes about legislative violence, you can, of course, read an article published on the Beehive, the Mass Historical Society's blog um, that details the Lyons Griswold affair in detail. Now, of course, thank you, of course, to Simmons and the POP Fund. Thank you to the Mass Historical Society for letting me run a muck in your archives. And thank you to all of the professors and other administrators who helped me here at Simmons. Yay. Thank you, everyone, for your excellent presentations. We will now move into the Q&A portion a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. Um, so any questions? If any questions remain for any of these presenters, please put them in the chat. We're going to get going. We're going to get started with the questions. We had some great questions in the chat. First question for Emma. Your major and minors are more science focused. So what was it like for you to work on the policy side of things with REACH? 
Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, so it was really interesting. I hadn't really worked on policy before, so I was definitely kind of going into the unknown. And I actually started um, this internship and I was only supposed to be an online chat intern. Um, and then during the first week, my supervisor was like, do you also want to work on legislative things? And I was like, no. And then I was like, wait, hold on, I should um, kind of just take that chance. Um, so it was really good. And she was really supportive. Um, so it was really nice to kind of work with her and be able to learn. And, um, and like navigate policy. And of course I did some in when I was doing public health, but I kind of definitely went to the science side. So it was kind of nice to kind of see that policy side of things and see all the people in the coalition meetings and kind of how they use their different skill sets and positions to advocate for legis um, like legislation. So yeah, it was really interesting. Thank you, Emma. We have a question for Beza. Faye's a great presentation. What was your experience like working outside Simmons? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think it was interesting because I got to learn a lot of instruments that we didn't have at Simmons currently. So it was a good learning experience, such as like the microscope that I got to use and the vibratome I got to use. Um, and I got to learn different techniques from different lab members um, from the lab as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Shania, you said that the audience for your project was not necessarily who you expected at the beginning. Can you say more about that? Like how the audience was not who you were expecting um, and how you kind of adapted your project? Yeah, so in my last project that was more of a podcast uh, platform, I didn't quite realize that there were a lot of non Igorot Americans who were interested in learning more about like cultural heritage, um, history wise, and what like identity looks like now when there's a lot of nuances and a lot of like seeing indigenous identities or like lifestyles in its own little simulation. That's what a lot of people was assuming I'd be covering. But no, I was covering a lot of diasporic um, Igorot like narratives where a lot of Igorots are either migrants or uh, longtime like settlers in the States. And so that caused like a bit of confusion with the folks who are interested in learning more versus the folks who um, are impacted by this type of information that's being uh, made. Thank you, Shania. Um, Henna, what an interesting project and great work, Henna. Why did you choose alginate and neem oil as the coating instead of another combination? Um, so the reason why we decided to use alginate and neem oil is because neem oil is known to have like antioxidant and antibacterial properties. Um, so we knew that it would do a good job at protecting the sample from decay. And the reason why we use alginate is because it's all natural and it's um, low cost and it's also edible. Thanks, Hannah. Question for Lauren. Great project, Lauren. What was the most surprising thing you learned during your archival research? So one of the su surprising things for me was learning about the Blount affair, because I don't think we really talk about it or acknowledge it, but William Blount was a senator from Tennessee and he was the first uh, US federal official ever impeached. He basically, he was a land speculator um, and he basically racked up a bunch of debt and tried to convince Native Americans in Spanish Florida to launch an attack against British forces that were still in the area um, as an attempt to cede this, this territory to the US. And of course this plot is uncovered and he's expelled from the Senate and then he's impeached and he never shows up. Um, they basically send letters, summons to him three or four times, he never shows up. And there's this moment where um, Adams is being consulted by the Speaker of the House, um, Senate President being, what are we, are we gonna go to Tennessee and drag him back to the Capitol, which at this time was still in um, Philadelphia? Or are we just going to let him go? And basically, they just let him go. Um, and he lives out the, the rest of his life as the Senate president in the um, 
Tennessee state legislature. But that's our first official impeachment trial in the US. Very interesting. Thank you. Let's see. Do we have more questions? We have some very technical science questions. Um, and we have time, so I'll ask them. Um, okay, such a cool project and great presentation, Beza. I was wondering why you didn't just look at morphology for astrocytes. Yeah, so, um, so for astrocytes, research showed that we could just look at the expression of the marker to determine if it's activated or not. So we didn't have to look at the shapes and um, the morphology of the astrocytes. So that's why we only did it for uh, microglia cells. Question for Lauren. What was your reaction to learning about the way, like the, the conflicts between Adams and his party in Congress? Like, did you understand why he behaved that way? Or were you kind of like, oh, you know, like what was your reaction? Honestly, I feel kind of bad for John Adams. And I know that I probably shouldn't say that because of course he did sign the Alien Sedition Act into law, which basically um, took away um, our First Amendment rights to freedom of speech. But the guy really was did not have it easy because he wasn't very personal and he wasn't very charismatic, especially when you're going up against somebody like Alexander Hamilton or Thomas Jefferson, who we know were um, and were also apparently gorgeous. Um, and he was this really small, stout guy, bald, red face. Um, and he was really tormented by his peers. Um, at one point, his personal journal was stolen from him and read aloud on the Congress floor. Um, and so I, I do feel bad for him. Um, however, he was not the most savvy politician, I like to say, because um, pretty early on, we could already see things shaking out where the U.S. was going to be a two-party system, and it was pretty much going to be drawn along regional lines, north and south, for the time being. And if you wanted a political career, you, you, chose, you chose a party, and you lived and died by that party and that party agenda. And he didn't want any of that because he was such a brilliant political theorist. So great political theorist, really bad politician. And I feel bad for him at times because of that. Thank you, Lauren. And oh, oh we just got a question come in for Beza. Okay. Okay, question for Beza. I was wondering how the rats mirrored having Huntington's or if they didn't at all. Um, that's actually a really good question. So we, it was the, the mice uh, focus ultrasound didn't take, we didn't really look at the behavior of the mice. We just knew by their gene that they were, um, they had a mutated HTT gene. So we didn't really look to see if they had like behaviors or that wasn't something that our project focused on, but that is a good question. Thank you so much to all of our presenters and thank you to everyone who asked questions. We had a very engaged audience with some great questions. Um, we have a couple more presentations today, two more presentations. You can go to the symposium website and check them out and join us if you would like for the remaining presentations. Also, please check out our video exhibit featuring undergraduate student research projects and creative works on the Simmons YouTube channel. The link to the video exhibit is in the, is in the chat box and available on our event page. So you can just go to the link in the chat. And that is it. Thank you so much to everyone. Great being here with you. See you later. Have a good day, everyone.